Good morning. morning. And welcome all of you to to this worship service today on this wonderful Father's Day. And happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers or grandfathers. I'm glad that you're here with us. A couple of prayer concerns. Please remember uh, Julie Sargent again in your prayers. She was been in the hospital this past week and she expects to have a major surgery when she's strong enough, uh, really as soon as possible, but she's going to go to Jonesboro Rehab to gain some strength before surgery, so she still struggles to remember her in your prayers. Also, uh, just heard that Tony O'Cretney's, I think it was his grandfather, is that correct, fell in some valley somewhere in Alabama, disoriented, so please remember uh, Tony in your, your prayers. And um, also, Darrell Williams, great niece, ne- nephew who ran in front of his great grandfather's lawnmower. Uh, and having multiple surgeries to repair some damages caused by that just horrible accident. And remember those on the prayer list as well. Um, you see we have two sets of flowers in the sanctuary, one in, in the niche who remembers or celebrates Kara and Will, Will Rogers' 30th anniversary, and then the ones on the floor are in memory of Tricia Wilson, whose service was held at the church yesterday. Also, you see an insert. We, once again, it's time of the year to receive suggestions from you for possible elders or deacons, so just write down some names and drop this in the offering plate when the offering is passed in a few moments. Let us prepare our hearts to worship God. May we join together in the call to worship which is printed in your bulletin. Holy God, the Father of us all, we gather to worship you and to reaffirm our shared relationship as children of God. Renewing God, we gather to be reinvigorated in worship and in witness and relationships that flow from worship. The Lord our God gives new life and new blessings as we come together in the unity of one purpose to praise and glorify God. May we may we be at worship together, opening hymn as joyful, joyful, we adore thee, hymn number four sixty-four. 
May we pray. The gracious God, it's easy to be distracted in our worship, to lose sight of the reasons for being here. Help us, Lord, to be focused on you, to be in tune with your Holy Spirit, to be thankful for your providential care, and to keep our eyes on your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art in hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our affirmation of today is an appropriate day to have this affirmation as we prepare for baptism is question number 165 from the larger catechism. I'll ask the question and you will respond. What is baptism? Baptism is the sacrament of the New Testament, wherein Christ hath ordained the washing with water in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In, of remission of sins by His blood, and regeneration by His Spirit, of adoption and resurrection unto everlasting life. And whereby the parties baptized, admitted into the visible church, and enter into an open and professed engagement to be holy and only the Lord's. Amen.
Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And because we have faith in him, we dare now with confidence to approach God. May we confess our sins to God silently. May we now pray the prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin. When our faith is rooted deeply in you, O God, our lives reflect your kingdom values of justice and righteousness. But sometimes our lives become so entangled with the values of the world that your values take second place. Forgive us, O God, and reconnect us to the Holy Spirit, source of power and life. Strip our hearts and minds of all that prevents our lives being rooted in you. In the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and be alive to, to all that is good. Friends, hear and truly believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, all of our sins are indeed forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, before baptism, I invite the young people to please come forward for the children's moment. back. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are y'all asleep? Are you being nice to your father this morning? You taking care of him? You are? You promise? Yes. We're going to do something special today. Do you know what we're going to do around this funny looking thing? We're going to baptize a little baby. Do you know what baptism means? No? Well, we're going to take some water. We're going to say a prayer. And we're going to bless the water. And then I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of this water on Zoe's head. And that means that she's a child of God. She already is a child of God. We all are. But this is a very special way of saying, Lord, we give her to you. You've cleansed her. You've made her part of, of your family and you're going to be part of that today as she joins the church as a baptized member and that water is a way of washing away everything that we will ever do this bad and it's a stamp that I'm going to place on her forehead by the Holy Spirit that can't be washed away at all it's going to tell everybody that she's a child of God forever and ever and ever so I want you to sit right there and be quiet if possible and watch what we do, okay? Tell you what, y'all all slide right over here so you can see. All the way. Come on, all the way over this way. I'll come forward. Are you ready? Good, Lucy. May we listen to these words concerning baptism. The Bible teaches all of us that the sign of salvation is to be applied to children of believing parents. In the Old Testament, that sign was 
circumcision in the New Testament, that sign is bat baptism. The baptism of our children symbolizes the reality that they are indeed set apart in the sight of God. Baptism is the first step toward full membership in the church of Jesus Christ. It is a sign that God loves Zoe long before Zoe can love God. And baptism assures our children and especially the parents that the benefits of the new covenant belong to all the family and not just to the adult members. It's a symbolic offering of the child's life to the Lord by the parents when the child is too young to do so for, for herself or himself. The sacrament of baptism is indeed a precious privilege as well as a very high duty which belongs to every member of the Presbyterian Church into whose home the Lord has sent children. Joseph and Misty, I have a few questions for you. In presenting your child for baptism, you announce your own faith in Jesus Christ and you show that you want Zoe, your child, to study him, to know him, and serve him as a chosen disciple. I'll show you your purpose now by answering these questions. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, do you? Yeah. Do you trust in him, do you? Do you intend for your children, Zoe and Lucy, to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love, do you? Yeah. Do you now promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Zoe and Lucy an example of new life in Christ, do you? Yeah. Now I have some questions for you. And again, I remind you, your response is not just yes. We're going to get this right one day. Your response to the first question, if you listen carefully, is we do. And the second question is the same. Do you? We do. We will. Do you, the members of this congregation, in the name of the whole church of Jesus Christ, undertake with these parents the Christian nurture of this child Zoe, so that in due time she may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? We do. Praise the Lord. Will you endeavor by your faith and example and fellowship to strengthen Zoe's family ties in the household of God? Will you? We will. May we pray. Ever-loving God, in your mercy, you promise to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you this day for receiving Zoe by baptism. Keep her always in your love. Guide her as she grows in faith. Protect her from the temptations and dangers of life. We pray now especially for parents, Joseph and Misty, give them wisdom and patience to guide their children in the way of Jesus Christ and the faith of the church. And let your peace and joy dwell in their home, in their family life, be instructed by faith, sustained by prayer, and governed by love. Strengthen them in their own baptism, that, may, that they may rejoice as children of God and serve you faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Zoe Jeanette Qualba. <laughs> Zoe Jeanette Qualabom, child of God, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> She's now received a very special stamp on her head. A stamp that says that she is God's forever. Forever and ever and ever. And you've promised, you've promised to help raise her in the Christian church. I know, I should have had you sit out in front. Next time we have one, I have you sit out in front, okay? I'm sorry. But you've promised to help raise this child in the Christian church. To tell her about the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and to remind her that what we've done today can never be removed from her forehead. She has been engrafted into the body of Christ forever. And I pray that we will all do a good job raising this child in the church. And now, representing the church, could you please return Zoe to her parents? Oh. As a new member, this Thank is a new you. tradition for you. Uh, hey, darling. How did you know I love babies? <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> May we now join together in the congregational response, which is printed in your bulletin. Zoe, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he went through the agony of Gethsemane and the darkness of Calvary. For you, he triumphed over death. For you, little child, even though you do not know it. But this is what we believe. We love God because he first loved us. Welcome to the family of faith. Thank you all. You be seated. May we pray. Almighty God of all of creation, we join our voices to praise you today, singing of your wonders, giving thanks for your grace and care, and celebrating the joys of life you've blessed us with, family and friends, new relationships and deeper relationships, new life and transformed lives, reconciliation and restoration. On this day, we are especially grateful for the gift of fathers, the, the gifts of being a father and, and the fathers that we miss. We thank you for the many ways that our fathers have shaped us for their example and their love. Yet we also pray for, for those who have painful relationships with their fathers, those who are estranged from their fathers and father and, who are, and fathers who are estranged from their children. And God, we, we pray for those who are unwilling or unable to accept the responsibilities of fatherhood. Gracious God, all of our prayers are summed up in the longing of your kingdom, that wonderful, amazing, and new reality that is emerging all around us. So we join our voices together, God, praying for the coming of your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our one Lord and Savior.
Let us now express our faith by joyfully sharing our gifts with those who benefit from the ministry of this church in our congregation, in our community, in our nation, and indeed around the world. May we bring our gifts to God. May we pray. Open our eyes, Lord, not only to the opportunities we have to receive things that enhance our lives, but also to the opportunities we have to share your grace and blessings with, other, with others. Receive our gifts as part of that commitment to share. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May we remain standing as we sing, This is My Father's World, hymn number 293.
Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from, from one of the Ten Commandments. Turn with me to Exodus if you would like, or simply listen to Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. May we listen very carefully for God's word to all of us. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. This is indeed the word of God. Amen. May we pray. Gracious God, we pause now to hear your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so we will hear and faithfully respond. Amen. Father's Day. I want to reflect this morning on our fathers, and I want to do that by reflecting on my own father, if possible. My dad, as many of you know and have you've heard, died when I was only 19 years old, a sophomore at college. And it's hard to believe as I reflect on that, it's been almost 40 years. Time flies by, almost 40 years. And I realize that perhaps today, today we're entering an emotional minefield for some, me included. Some of us had great experiences with our fathers, and others had very painful experiences with our fathers. Today I want to list a few things that my dad gave to me. Now, while I cannot recite scripture passage, passages for every single one, I do believe somehow they are biblical. Gift number one. The gift of a stable environment in, in which to grow up. Except for the first three years of my life, I lived in the same house until I went off to college. The same house. Went to one church, one school system, one very close group of friends, some of whom I stay in close contact with even to this very day. And as I reflect on this part of my life, I can't help but think about our family after we were called into ministry. And I'm sure that Watson and my wife will correct me, but nine or ten different houses, maybe more. One apartment, which was horrible. The apartment wasn't horrible, but because of a puppy Labrador retriever that I thought was a good idea to give to my wife the Christmas we were in that apartment, it was horrible. <laughs> six, maybe seven, maybe five, six, seven, five, I don't know what it was, the number different communities, several different school systems, right, Watson, several school systems for Emory and Watson. And I know that Emory was in three high schools in four years. I'm sure that was difficult for them, and they've told me that at times. But we tried to be as faithful as we could. I had the gift of growing up in a very, very stable family. Now, I've had many conversations through the years with folks whose growing up years were utter chaos. Utter chaos. Divorce. Moved more times than they cared to remember. Drinking problems. Abuse, etc. Now, I can't relate to any of that. None of that. And I'm thankful. There was always food on our table. I knew that my Dad loved my mom very much. I knew what school I would go to. I knew what church I would attend. I knew who my friends would be. And that allowed me to be the kid that, that I needed to be. And I didn't have to deal with a, adult stuff prematurely. And I believe that was a good thing. The second gift my dad gave me was a solid sense of personhood. A solid sense of personhood. My dad was a very defined, defined individual. He knew who he was and what his purpose was. He was not very complicated at all. He knew what he liked and he knew what he didn't like. And he knew who he liked and he knew whom he didn't like. 
He didn't like iced tea. Now, growing up in the South, I find that kind of strange. He didn't like it. I don't know why. He didn't like the Red Cross. I think I've mentioned this to you before. He didn't like the Red Cross at all. He didn't want to, want to talk about it. Something happened in the war, World War II. He wasn't going to talk about it. He never talked about the war. He didn't like the Red Cross. That's his problem and was his problem. He couldn't handle the cold weather, weather, the bitterly cold weather in South Carolina. <laughs> I remember when I was young, I would often see Dad wrapped up in a blanket when it was only 55 degrees. And I uh, remember asking Mom, you know, what's wrong with Dad? And she said, don't ask him. Don't ask him. And it was later that I found out that Whenever it was under 60 degrees, he just became cold feeling. He fought in four major battles of World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He received many accommodations, and he never talked about it. We found about that out about all of his medals years after he died, years and years after he died. Bronze Star recipient, two Purple Hearts, and I could go on and on. But he wasn't going to talk about it. He didn't tell me about it. But any time it became cold, it reminded him of that harsh winter battle, the Battle of the Bulge. He left the house every morning at 6 a.m. for work every morning. He returned every day between 5 and 5.15, every day. And every day he would come home, change his clothes, and then go outside and work in the yard, perhaps to get away from my mom. I don't know really the real reason. But every day. He taught me to never plant a $10 plant in a $1 hole. Does that make sense to any of you? It took me years to figure that one out. Numerous plants that I planted died, and I finally figured that out. And when he wasn't working in the yard, he was always throwing the ball with me. Now, he could be a man of very few words, but he loved to laugh. He taught me to be my own person. He taught me that life is too short to always be worried about someone else's agenda. Now, I have to admit, I struggle with that. I struggle with that even to this day. I do worry about other people's agenda. Daddy never did. And when you grow up in a well-defined environment, you are able to ask freely questions such as, Who am I? What is life about? What do I like? What do I don't like? Sorry for the bad grammar. What is God's purpose for my life? The third gift Dad gave me is the gift of labor. I know that's hard for some of you to believe, but it's true. The gift of labor. I never heard him, in my short time with him, complain about his job. Never. And I never, ever heard him complain about co-workers, which seems to be so popular in our culture today. Never. He felt work was a noble task, and he thought everyone should be involved in this noble task, this noble activity. Every Saturday, I was required to work in the yard. Every Saturday, required. It was non-negotiable. I loved it. My brother hated it. My brother nine years older. He would always invite friends to come over before I kind of took over some of the yard work and they would help him so he could finish a little bit faster so he could head off to the beach only 12 miles away. I loved working in the yard with Dad all day long. Robbie hated working in the yard until the day he died and I love it. I love it when I'm outside planting and mowing and raking leaves. Not necessarily because I really do love it but I feel this special presence when I'm doing that. The next gift my dad gave me was the gift of opportunity. I was encouraged to take advantage of all opportunities. I played football, basketball, baseball, golf, swim team. As some of you know, piano lessons, that was mom's idea. <laughs> I can play. You will never hear me play, though. I toured Europe on a bicycle when I was only 15 years old. Six different countries in about three weeks. A wonderful trip with over a hundred Christian teenagers. And I returned the summer before my senior year of high school. I thank God for the wide range of opportunities that I enjoyed. And I've never viewed the world as a place to retreat and hide, but rather 
I view the world as a place of opportunity. The final gift, the gift of a strong spiritual heritage. The last gift my dad gave me is the gift I cherish the most. See, I knew that at the core, even though he died when I was 19, at the core of my dad's being was a heart totally surrendered to God. Totally. I never doubted that. He lived it. And my memories of, of dad and church, really one word, commitment. Simple as that, commitment. When the doors of the church were opened, we were there. He served faithfully as an elder and deacon. We were at the church so much that I thought my dream job would one day be superintendent of Sunday schools. <laughs> Do you know why? Some of you can think back. Why? Because the superintendent of Sunday schools never had to go to Sunday school. <laughs> right? We don't have that person anymore. I don't know why that disappeared from the church. But I thought it was a dream job to have. The superintendent just walked around the church counting the people in attendance, counting the money, collecting the money. He had this cute little office that kind of overlooked the beautiful Waccamaw River in Conway, South Carolina, outside the back of Kingston Presbyterian Church. They had, he had one adult assistant. And after counting the money, they would go to the fellowship hall and play ping pong until after worship. <laughs> and I remember vividly one day, my brother and I would sit up in the balcony, mom and dad in the choir. He was in charge of me, but one Sunday, he wasn't up there taking care of me. So mom left the balcony, walked outside of the church, found my brother playing ping pong in the fellowship hall. As mom was berating him about his lack of presence in the church, she turned and noticed there was the superintendent of Sunday school playing ping pong with my brother. So then mom started berating him as well. <laughs> ping, pong, ping pong was stopped during the worship hour after that Sunday. A great job. A great job. I wanted that job. You know, I had the option of going to church when I was young. I had that option. The option was, you will go to church. <laughs> Simple as that. You will go to church. The message was sometimes painfully clear. You will be committed to the church. That was the option. You know, it sounds kind of strict for today's culture, doesn't it? It does. But I'm grateful for that gift. My dad also taught me the gift of sharing the faith. And I think that's a good thing. When the Jehovah's Witness would knock on the door, when they came visiting, he would always welcome them into our home. He would say this. He would say, I would love to talk to you, but you're going to give me the first 45 minutes. They were thrilled to leave our house. <laughs> and as I reflect on these gifts, they really are part of who I am. Now, I left out some of the negative details, of course, and I left out some of the painful memories. They were some, of course, but not many at all. Not many. So what are we, what are we to do today? Well, I recommend that we take the biblical path to honor our parents, our dads, our mothers, and to even forgive them if that is needed. You know, it's been a good thing thinking about my dad, thinking about all of this this week, but here's one thing I would like, just five more minutes with my dad. Just five more minutes to have a man-to-man -man conversation now, just five minutes to say thank you for the gifts that he's given me and to tell him how thankful I am that he influenced my life. Just five minutes. But I will not have that opportunity this side of heaven. I will not have those five minutes. Some of you will. Some of you will. So I encourage you to bestow upon your father, your mother, if it is possible, as you lead your children and your grandchildren, to bestow honor upon them. Happy Father's Day. Happy Mother's Day again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning comes from the Red Song, song Book, a hymn we don't sing very often. Hymn number nine in the song book, Faith of Our Fathers.